right, ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? Uh, this is Mrs. Alice. This is the flip video on the Middle Ages that you need to watch so that you can answer your guided reading. All right, we're going to get started because I only have 15 minutes. Bye. All right, introduction. The post-classical began in Europe with the decline and fall of Rome and extended until the 15th century. So basically, the Middle Ages is going to be from the fall of Rome to the Renaissance. All right, that is what it's called, Middle Ages. It's between civilization during the Roman Empire and it's going to be at the birth of a new era of civilization in Western Europe with the Renaissance. All right, some major themes that not only matter in the Europe during this time, they matter anywhere during the post-classical, but they also are pertinent to Western Europe are, uh, number one, the spread of civilization. Um, civilization is going to spread throughout all of Western Europe by the end of the Middle Ages. You have to remember after the fall of Rome, a lot of what made them civilized kind of fell apart and they're going to have to rebuild. The second theme is the spread of religious beliefs. Christianity is going to spread throughout all of Western Europe during this time. They're going to go from polytheistic pagan religions with nature gods to Christians. Um, and this is really big with the lives of the serfs during this time period, which are very difficult. And they used their faith in God and their faith in heaven as kind of a way to get through um, a fairly unbearable life. Um, three, they participated in a network of extended trade contacts. So even though Europe is technically in the Dark Ages, um, they still do have contact with other people. The big issue with this is that instead of giving in that contact, they're really just taking. Europe really doesn't have much to offer other areas of the world at the time, so they're just taking. So example, they got crops from Africa, agricultural techniques from Asia, Arab technology through the Mediterranean, and then from the Byzantines and the Arabs, they're eventually going to get back a lot of math, science, and philosophy that they lost after the fall of Rome, but um, was saved by those Muslim scholars. All right, there are two images of the Middle Ages, one that you're probably very familiar with, the fact that they were tragically backwards and that it's dark and nothing's going on in Europe and they're all just like building Gothic cathedrals and doing nothing else, which is for the most part true. Serfs' lives really did revolve around religion, uh, serving their Lord, and hoping that they got into heaven to escape their lives. But there were flashes of intellectual brilliance. There's a lot of philosophy going on during this time. The most famous of this is Thomas Aquinas. You're going to um, look into him a little bit more in the second part of this guided reading. All right, and then the next question is, how could Western Europe be backward and advance at the same time? Not answering that. You guys need to do that yourselves. All right. The Middle Ages is divided into two time periods. The first is the early Middle Ages, which is the 6th to 10th centuries, and the second is the High Middle Ages, which is the 11th to the 14th centuries. The High Middle Ages is when they're kind of making their way out of um, the, the disaster that was the fall of Rome. All right, so in the early Middle Ages, there are some very um, big problems that kind of caused Europe to be pretty stagnant for a while. Rome's decline really does fracture the area. It becomes completely politically um, divided. Uh, instead of having a unified Roman Empire, now they have uh, many different feudal states. All right, Spain during this time period is controlled by the uh, Muslims. You guys know that from uh, chapter 6 and 7. And Spain is going to be under Muslim control until uh, the very end of the early Middle Ages. Uh, they're also suffering from frequent invasions by the Vikings, um, and they have lots of weak rulers. Um, and weak rulers can't get things organized and kind of bring things back. So they're kind of just in a very stagnant place where life is really, for the majority of the people living in Europe, not really that great. All right, this is when the manorial system is going to develop. When you think of the manorial system, you need to think of it as the micro of feudalism. Feudalism is the whole entire kingdom of that king. Manorialism are the different manners that were given to all the different lords. So the king would divide his entire kingdom into fiefs, and each lord would get a fief, and on it he would have a manor, and that's where manorialism comes. So feudalism, big picture, manorialism, little picture. And it basically works the same way as feudalism. On a manor, the Lord has a manor. He has serfs. The serfs work his land and give him their crops. And he can either trade the crops or they usually ate the crops. And in exchange for them providing him with his um, agricultural uh, produce, the king would protect them, or the Lord. The Lord would protect the serfs from Viking invasions or other invasions by using his military force, which was made up of knights. 
All right, the manorialism was strengthened by the fact that there was a decline of trade during this time period, and they really just had to survive on what they had, um, and also the fact that there were no central governments. Um, the life of a serf, which I've said over and over, was really not fun. Uh, one of the things that made it really difficult was that they were the agricultural um, backbone, and they didn't really have very advanced agricultural techniques. They have a couple things that help them, but not really much. Uh, they had the moldboard plow, and then they used the three-field system in which they would leave one-third of the field empty um, every year so that it could rebuild its nutrients and then uh, grow uh, a better crop the next year. Uh, it's called crop rotation. We still do it today. Um, uh, the manorial system, as I've said, serfs provide the crops, and for that um, they get protection from invasions by the lord. They were not slaves. They were attached to the land. Um, they actually owned the land, but because they had to pay such high taxes to the Lord, and et cetera, et cetera, they basically were the equivalent of a slave, but treated better. And their life was short, brutish, and harsh. All right, one thing that was very important during this time period is the Catholic Church. It really is the only thing that provided any sense of organization. Um, the organization of the Catholic Church copied that of the Roman Empire, so the Pope is like the Emperor, the Bishop is like a Governor, and the local priest is like a local ruler. All right, the Pope is incredibly important during this time period. Uh, one of the things he did to increase his power is he promoted conversion of leaders so that he could spread and extend the power of the Catholic Church. An example of this is Clovis, um, who was the ruler of an area in Germany. He converted in 496 to gain prestige over rival local rulers who remained pagan. So he converted so that the Pope would take favor on him and then he would gain advantages by being connected to the Pope who was the most powerful ruler in Western Europe at the time. Uh, this is when monasteries are going to become very important. A monastery, if you did not know, is a um, facility in which monks live and they do a lot of different things. Sometimes they were educators, sometimes they're copying aluminum manuscripts, sometimes they're like that Mendel guy and they're farming. They did a lot of different things that actually did provide a lot of different services, um, not just spiritual, but also um, secular uh, to the people living during that time. Um, and monks still today are known for providing education and promoting literacy. Lots of monks still work um, in schools and universities. All right, Charlemagne, you guys have all heard of Charlemagne. Um, Charlemagne is going to take over the Holy Roman Empire, and he's going to um, expand the lands of his family, the Carolin Carolingians. All right, that family is founded by Charles Martel, who you guys should know because he's the one who defeated the, Muslim at the Muslims at the Battle of Tours in 732 CE. So he's the one who's going to expel Muslim rule from Spain and from the European continent. All right, so he's super important. Um, Charlemagne is his son. Charlemagne is going to extend the empire in France and Germany uh, around 800 CE. He helped restore the church-based education in Western Europe. Um, intellectual activity is going to slowly start to increase because he rules such a large area and he thinks it's important. Uh, one thing that's important for you to know is up here is that Charlemagne's nickname was the Holy Barbarian because he was holy in that he spread Christianity, but that he was a barbarian because if you didn't convert to Christianity, he killed you. Not so nice. Um, after his uh, death, he's going to divide his empire between his three sons, which was a bad idea. Why is it bad? Because the people start to compete for loyalties. There's a lack of a strong bureaucracy because everything is now split into three. There's a lack of cultural unity other than the church. Um, there's no common language. The church speaks Latin. The people speak the vernacular, England or French. And this is going to lead to the development of national identities such as English, French, and German. All right, new economic and urban vigor by 900 CE, so we're now moving into the high Middle Ages. Um, the agricultural developments such as the moldboard plowed and the three field system are making things um, better and more advanced, so agriculture is increasing, so they're not spending as much time growing food and so they can look at other things. Uh, the Lord's armies of knights actually are becoming more advanced because they now have the horse collar and stirrups, which allowed for better fighting on horseback. And European nobility is defined by land ownership and military power. So basically your position in a uh, medieval, high Middle Ages European uh, 
society is based on your money and you get your money from how much land you own. All right, monasteries are promoting better education. They're also um, providing education. Viking raids are starting to decrease and political stability was promoted by very important a population increase because of agricultural production increase. When you have more food, you can support more people. People can have more babies. Those babies live healthier lives and they have more babies. It's pretty simple. All right, population growth promotes economic innovation. Uh, the more people you have, the more markets you have to sell your goods. That means that towns are going to start to increase because people aren't having to spend all their time uh, growing food so they can start having other occupations. Uh, as the population increases, they're going to colonize new areas uh, that couldn't have been colonized before because of the land. They have better tools. Now they can farm in northeastern Germany. The bonds of serfdom are going to start to decrease as laborers start to demand that they get paid, especially those who live in towns. Uh, contact brought new crops from North Africa. We're going to get Durham and from Persia, alfalfa. Mmm, sprouts. All right, merchant and craft activity increase. So as these towns grow, because there are less people having to do agriculture and more jobs, they're building new uh, items and things for trade, etc. It's all connected. All right, social changes. Literary C is going to spread because of population increase in urban areas. More people learn how to read. Popular uh, languages are developing. Professional entertainers. There's a bunch of fun stuff going on at the same time as uh, the economy and everything increases. Education is going to start to increase. We're going to have universities. We're going to have gotten back a lot of Roman and Greek and Hellenistic science from trade with the Muslims. And philosophy and theology are going to become more advanced. All right, here's your feudal monarchy, which I just said earlier. Feudalism, big picture. No, I can't talk to you right now. Feudal monarchies are the big picture. All right, so this is how a feudal monarchy is uh, organized, which I kind of already said. You have the king. The king gives land to the lord. The lord pro provides protection to the king because the lord has his own army. So if the king goes to war, the lord's army goes to war with the king. Vassals are lesser lords, and they provide military service, goods, payments, and advice. All right, vassals are knights and things of that nature. And then at the very bottom, you have your peasants and your serf. Your peasants may be living in those towns that established now, and the serfs are still on the manors. Uh, large kingdoms use the feudal system because they couldn't afford a large bureaucracy. They just don't have the money to pay for it. Um, and one thing that's very important is this. Feudalism inhibited the development of strong central states. All right, feudal monarchy in France. We're not going to really talk about that. Um, you guys are actually going to do an activity on the monarchies in France and England uh, later. Uh, feudalism in Europe is similar to China. They developed explicit uh, rules. Oh, I forgot to put that word in there. Uh, they have specialized functions for certain people. The kings tax the subjects directly, not the lords. And they all have small professional armies. All right, limits to feudalism, which is very important. The feudal kingdoms had trouble because they had to compete with the Pope. So a feudal lord isn't going to get as much uh, loyalty from his people because they're also going to be loyal to the Pope. So he's got, they're kind of sharing power with the Pope. Aristocrats had powerful voice and military forces so they could kind of get what they wanted. Um, this is going to change a little bit in England. King John is going to try and tax his subjects, and he loses a war in France. So because of that... Um, they uh, demand that he signs the Magna Carta in 1215, and he's actually going to lose rights to um, the aristocracy. All right, feudal rights led to parliaments, which are representative bodies to protect the rights of the privileged. Example, nobles and church leaders. Parliaments were not established to protect peasants. All right, the parliaments are strongest in England, but they were also used in France, Spain, Scandinavia, and Germany. This is kind of the beginning of the feudalism breaking down and them having more democratic forms of government. Very important is that these parliaments are only going to represent the wealthy, the church, the nobles, the urban leaders, those are the people with money. All right, the West expansionist impulse, most concrete German knights and agricultural settlers are moving to East Germany and Poland. Spain is going to expand the spread of Christianity because it kicks out the Muslims, so they're going to make all those Muslims convert to uh, Christianity. All right, we're going to talk about crusades when we uh, watch a video uh, from John Green and you guys are actually going to do some other crusade stuff, so we're not going to... I'm going to run out of time, run out of time! Uh, uh, secularism is worldly, meaning they focus on things on this planet and they're not focusing on spiritual things. It becomes a big problem that's going to later lead to the Protestant Reformation. 
All right, I gotta pause it. I ran out of time.